So yeah, I need to start with a sentence. You are really great. I mean, I really enjoyed all the speeches that you did, all the presentation. Um, you're doing great, and I like the fact that technology, you use technology to do something great. So uh, sometimes when we go to conferences, it's technology for technologies, but this is technology at the service for something uh, good and variable. So well done. Uh, thank you for that. But yeah. I'm Gianluca. I work as a site reliability engineer at Influx Data. Influx Data is a company that provides a set of open source tools to do monitoring. Um, so there is a time series database, and there is a collector, and a bunch of other stuff that, in some way, we are going to see um, here. I blog time to time. I try to do it more frequently. And I'm active on Twitter, so um, follow me if you like. And other than that, I make dirty hacks that looks awesome. So I'm really proud of that. And uh, I grow vegetables, so I'm from Italy. I have a garden. I like to go outside and put some stress out of me, just you know, punching the herd with my, uh, my arms. And I like to travel for fun and work. When, I, when I'm able to, to join them together, it's the best experience. And in Cape Town, I took a few days to enjoy the city. And now I'm here to work, so I'm very happy about that. I'm going to start with a, a history about you know, how stuff really works. Every team now uses Docker or know how it is and how it works because it use, it's very useful to do local development. So you can spin up environments that look like the one you need, and you can share them with your colleagues in a very easy way. And a lot of people use Docker for testing because it's for the same reason. It's nice, and in runtime, you can create and destroy environment just in a matter of seconds. And that makes everything very easy. But now, Everyone speaks about Kubernetes. You go in a bar in a Starbucks, and people are speaking about Kubernetes. This happens everywhere. I mean, I travel a lot. In Italy, if you take a coffee, they are probably speaking about Kubernetes, and probably the coffee maker knows about Kubernetes. <laughs> so that's, that's it. If you go in San Francisco, a lot of people know about Kubernetes everywhere. Uh, there are, you know, when you buy something, probably the receipt is made by a Kubernetes cluster. So it's <laughs> everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. Nobody really knows how it works, but it's there. So it's a mood, it's a, it's a feeling. And now that you heard about that, you hire a new guy because of new folks, because you know, you're growing and growing. And for some reason, these folks knows about Kubernetes and DevOps. So he starts to kind of push you over the line. And at some point, you find yourself moving everything and everyone to Kubernetes. And the experience looked like, these, these pictures. I know that because we did that previously, so it was a mess. So this talk is, inspi is inspired by a true story, a true story that we are living at Influx Data right now. So I don't know about the hand of it. I hope it will be a good hand, but we're going to go together uh, over this. So, so let's come all together. This is a horse trip that I made in Cuba, and as you can see, the horse is very small compared to me, because this was my first ride. And so th the guy gave me a really uh, small, good, and sweet horse that wasn't going to you know, bore me that much. It was, was good. It was, was good. It was great. So first of all, you need to read and catch up with the technology. So the best uh, book that I can suggest you to start is Kubernetes Up and Running. Uh, the people that wrote it are great. They are involved in the community, and they started Kubernetes, so they know what they do. And the good, the good part is that it's really tiny, so it's not a 500-pages book about distributed system. It's about Kubernetes, and it's driven by experience, so you can see that all the pages come from people that used it in, in, uh, in production. They know what they are doing. It's practical. So you start from the beginning knowing anything, and you get to the end having a, an idea about how it should go. And it's easy. And bonus point, it looks really like the documentation. So when you end the book, you are really good at understanding how to find information in the Kubernetes community and world. So that, that's, that's also a good side effect. 
But how, how we started moving people to Kubernetes? This journey started because hazard influx data, we don't do just open source tools because otherwise we're going to be hard to eat. But uh, we have a SaaS offering and we sell the, the project has a under license too. So our current version of the SaaS doesn't use Kubernetes because it's too old. So we wrote an orchestrator that makes the job done. But we are doing the version two and the version two we use Kubernetes. So. Um, that's, that's why we are moving there. That's why we are over these journeys. So first of all, you need to make your hands dirty and you need to tell your team to try it and do stuff. So um, you spin up a cluster that you can break. So even if you don't have a software, if you don't have nothing, just spin up a cluster and start to break stuff together. The best way to, br to break stuff is to ask me, I'm an expert, but, Another way is to deploy your CI on Kubernetes. Uh, this is, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be your first CI, your main CI, but it can be a Jenkins server. And I know that everyone has a Jenkins server, so don't tell me that you don't have one. Everyone has one, even if it doesn't like it. So take your Jenkins server, install the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin, and you start your journey with Kubernetes. The good part about having a CI system is that your team relies on that. So it's going to, you know, you're going to push them to fix that or you're going to fix it and you're going to learn how to operate a production-like system on Kubernetes. So I find it very useful as a guinea pig to move people to Kubernetes. Obviously, you need to run your code in production. So I'm really against, you know, sysadmin and operational guy versus development. We are all on the same side. We are here to make this um, companies succeed and we do it together. So who write, who write the code is the best person to fix it. And so we work together on that. It's not like, it's not like silos here. Don't be scared and write your tools. So this is very important to me. As a, I work in automation in DevOps and now I work as a reliability engineer. So I know um, that everything has an API. So Amazon is is well known to be expensive, but why it is so expensive? It is, it is expensive because you can do whatever you want with, in automation with their API. So if you need to justify the cost of Kubernetes, you are not gonna do that opening the console and clicking around like a crazy monkey because that's not the way it should be. You should use their API and our role is to take all these API and all these providers that give us the API and make something that is useful for our team and for ourselves. Same for Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a gigantic tool, and in order to be, you know, to use it in the right way, yes, the kubectl is great. So the, the CLI tool that comes from with Kubernetes is great. It's super flexible, but the heart of it is the is the API. So don't be scared. Take the client and use the client. There are clients for you know, SDK clients for every languages, so you don't have any excuse. You can do whatever you want with it. So break stuff. One experience we made, we are all developers, and I need to do, I need to say something, we are all Go developers. So we use Golang, some of the stuff will be, uh, in my slides will be in Golang, but they will be applied for everywhere. So um, we don't like YAML, because we feel that we are not YAML engineers, so we are Go engineers in this case. And we are moving from a YAML specification to a Go specification like. So if you know Kubernetes, you know that you can specify everything you want based on YAML. So you can say, okay, give me a deployment, give me a pod, and it's like a giant YAML. Uh, we are doing the same, but with Go. So every SDK generates a bunch of models that they replicate what you do with the YAML, but you use the Go code. So, and that's it, that's what we are doing. We are doing that because, um, oh sorry. We are, we are doing that because as I said, you get a lot of stuff for free. Uh, one of them is the fact that Go is a, build, is a compiled language, so if you, if you use a field that doesn't exist, it's gonna tell you at compile time. So no more validation errors, no more uh, fields that doesn't exist, that's, that's it. And the SDK has a really good documentation, so if every time I say this stuff, somebody in the audience says, okay, but I'm not a Go developer, I'm not a Python developer, people know different languages, and YAML, it's easy. But 
you know, every time I need to do something, I need to open a documentation in Kubernetes and look for the right YAML to write. So I'm always there learning about how to do stuff. So it's the same for every language. If I'm going to use Python models, objects, or PHP objects other than YAML, it's almost the same. But I have auto-completion, my IDE works, and so on. So I see, I mean, it's not a point, but you know, something. Um, we are in the transi transition period, so we use our CI, our pipeline, to double check if we, we have still people that use YAML, or we do that when we are in a rush. We have people that use Go. And the good, si the good fact about having Go and a programming language is that you can embed your spec in your application. So as I, as I said, we write tools because we like to have the flow that we think applies better to our team. Um, and in order to write tools, one of the first tools we wrote is what I call a feature environment. So we, we, don't, we have a staging environment, but what we use most is a runtime environment generator kind of stuff. So a developer asks for a new environment that has th those versions of our applications and Kubernetes, and we have a tool that wraps the Kubernetes API and give us a namespace and a link with all the pods that it needs. So you can share the link, you can forward the traffic from the production to your feature environment to see how it works under loads and so on. And when we built that, the first version was using YAML. So it was a wrapper around the YAML, and you have templates, and you parse the template, and you change the variable. It was a mess. And it was untestable, ready to understand, ready to, uh, really hard to keep in sync between what there is in production and what it's running. So now that we have objects, we can you know, use them as a library. So you import the Kafka library that has our specification, and we deploy the Kafka uh, as it is. So right now that we're in this, this, this testing period, um, we have a CI that checks that YAML and Go are in line, but at some point the idea is that we should just read, out, uh, read, read off the, the YAML and uh, start to use Go. Another stuff that we are trying is what it's called GitOps. I have a few links at the end of the slides that I'm going to publish and you can read them. But the idea is that Git is the source for every change when, as a developer. When we, do, when, when we are doing a change, we, we open a pull a per request in the code base and somebody's gonna review it and if it's done, it's gonna be, if it's good, it's gonna be merged and it's gonna be deployed. So it's, this, it's the same for infrastructure as a code because this is what you get when you are on board on the has code stuff. You, know? you can just get the, the best part of the, of the world, you also need to, to take all of it. So infrastructure is, has a code. So if it has a code, it means that you can use Git as you do for the other stuff, for your application. So we do the same. Uh, we have all the infrastructure described as a code, and uh, when we change it, we, not, we open a pull request, somebody's going to review it, and uh, if it's good, it's going to be merged, and when it's merged, there is a CI that takes the, the new specification and applies that to Kubernetes or to AWS, we use CloudFormation, or you can use Terraform or whatever it is. But that's the way to go. And another side effect, another bonus point that you get is the fact that you don't, you don't need uh, to give right access to the Amazon console or to the Kubernetes API to your colleagues because everything goes through the CI. So they will, have write, they, they will have read access. They can go do kubectl apply, but the reading part is, the, the writing part is made by, um, by Git and your CI system and your validation checks and so on. But the good part is that you can test what's go, what, what, what's going to happen. Um, I don't, when you test for infrastructure, I mean, what we learned is that we don't test for what we expect. We, so it's not an assertion based testing as you do for the code. So this function should return five. Okay, I'm gonna test that it returns five. And that, that's what you do with unit testing. What, what we do for infrastructure as a code is, is the idea that you need to, you have, you have something that needs to really happen. So let's say that you, you are deploying an ATCD cluster or a MySQL uh, database, and you have a policy that says that you need to have at least three replicas of that MySQL. So that's what we're going to test in our pipeline. We are going to test that the specification 
uh, that we, we're going to we're gonna apply or the change that we're going to apply is um, respect the policy. So in, in our case, respect that MySQL needs to have three replicas. That's logic. Infrastructure as a code has a code use version control, so that's it. Nothing too complicated. Yeah, that, that's it. So everything is an API, so use it and make something good with it. You can start ju just using CUR uh, or Bash, but I think it's going to, we like the idea to have an operational friendly environment. So as you care about your user when you do a pretty good UI with good colors and feature flags, we do the same for operations. Um, we like to have fancy CLI that people can understand or, if they, or dashboard or whatever they are. So take care about that. One of the tools that we also wrote is a backup and restore operator for persistent volumes. Um, so they, if you know about Kubernetes, you know that storage has um, you know, storage is different based on where you are. So uh, on-premise, you have different, um, you know, providers, and Amazon has ABS volumes or Elastic File System, Google Cloud has its own, Microsoft has its own. So Kubernetes abstracts that with the concept of persistent volumes. And persistent volumes in, in version 113, I think, didn't support um, restore and uh, backup. So now in 114 it's going to be released, or it's already in 113. I don't remember. Anyway, uh, it, it was it was it was not supporting backups and restore, so we wrote our own way to do that. Um, yeah, as I told you before, we have a service that creates runtime environments that we can use, and we use them to do integration integration testing. So when our Jenkins spin up an integration test or an end-to-end -end test, it asks this service to give to uh, the test runner a uh, URL that it can, it can use. When the tests are gone, it removes, the, uh, it removes the environment and we are clean again. And also, we, we, if, you, if you use Kubernetes, you know that you can start um, to use it locally with Minikube. And we also had a kind of tool that does um, something similar, but with our stack. So it's called Kubon, and it does uh, a bunch of stuff related to uh, our way to deploy surf softwares. So that's it, use it. Another topic that we, we learn along the way is instrumentation and observability. So distributed systems are hard to understand, and Kubernetes makes, them, makes this situation even worse. So we need to think about what's going on in our system, and we need to have the ability to take pictures of our um, application in real time. So Kubernetes has um, replaced pods if they go out of memory, or you can kill them and they go replaced. So the idea is that troubleshooting is different, because you don't have your pod there if it, get, if it gets killed. So how do you understand why it, goes, it, it is um, or going out of memory? So you need to take a picture of the, of the system uh, as it is. And to do that, we use a bunch of libraries that Go gives us, but Java has the same, so it's like uh, runtime analysis of the engine. But other than that, it comes from the, the, the language you are, we are using. We also use events, metrics, logs, and traces. So when I think about logs, you know, they are really good. And I, I had a friend back in the day that was really good at tailing logs. So he was tailing logs all the time, and based on the, how fast or slow they was going, he was able to tell us if the application was good or not. <laughs> now, that was great. I mean, it was the best monitoring tool I ever had. So that's great. Now, you just ask him, he tails the log and says, hmm, this one is too slow, something is wrong. So that uh, was great. So it was great. So logs are good, but you need to index them, you need to parse them, you need to get value out of them. So events and metrics are the replacement or a consequences of the logs. So everything, is, is a, everything that I'm describing here is a time series. So uh, InfluxDB and my company works with time series. So it's everything that matters and changes on time. So if you think about the RAM usage, if you don't know where, uh, when your RAM is going up, 
doesn't really matter. It's just a number. So that's where, um, that's where we are. And events, metrics, log, and traces are just a different aggregation, a different combination of points in time. And that's why it's everything about collect and aggregate data. Because at the end of the story, logs are point in time. The metrics that your application generates, like the page views or uh, the number of logins, they are just point in time. And based on your, or on your questions, uh, you aggregate them in different way. So the key when you, are, when you are monitoring is store all the data you can and ask the right questions to your system. It's all about normal state versus current state. And that's ver a, a very simple and clear you know, um, set of words to read, but it's very hard. First, what's your normal state? How your normal state looks like? When I ask around to the people, what's happening now in your application? They, they just don't know. I just don't know, if you ask me. So uh, that's, that's even worse when you are in, in a distributed system environment when, uh, where um, microservices crashes and it brings your microservices down and you don't know who, what, who, who crashed first and so on. So this is where we are. And when we are so good about having our normal state, we should keep picturing the current state and compare them to see if everything is good or not. As I you know, pitched before, developers are the key. So there are no operation people or resilient people or whatever. There are no on-call people or not on-call people. We are all on the same side. And we are going to fix our issues together. If you think about, if you do everything well, so you are able to send events from your application, you have a Prometheus endpoint that, that um, ex expose the slash metrics endpoint, and if you send logs or if you do tracing, you have a lot of code that is not business logic, that is not framework or it is not services, and it's just for instrument your application. Think about how many lines of code you have in your, uh, how many lines of logs you have in your code, or how many traces or spans you are creating in your code. So observability code and the code that you use to instrument your application is a first citizen in your code base. It's not a printf anymore that is there and prints something on standard output, but it's something that it's a, a, that is the difference between being able to understand what's going on and don't have any idea about what's going on. So it's very important. Open Census is a specification and that Google uh, um, open sourced. Uh, I, it's a specification because it's a way um, to instrument application. And based on that specification, they released libraries for different languages. So there is Go, PHP, Java, Node.js, and whatever. So you can have a look at that to have an idea about what instrumentation means and what I mean when I say instrumentation is a first citizen. It's important. So it works like this. It's very simple. Uh, it's an SDK. You put that in your application, and you configure where to store your stats, your events, and where to store your traces. And you start to, in, from there, you start to, in, to instrument your, your application using Open Census. Um, so if, you, if tomorrow you need to change your source or your destination uh, for, the, um, for the metrics, because you are not using Prometheus anymore, but you are using InfluxDB or Datadog, uh, you can just change uh, the output at the beginning in the main of your, of your application. And that's it. Because if you start to use your application and you tie that to Prometheus or to another SDK, uh, you're going to be stuck there forever. And if your, if your code changes, your, your application grows, maybe Prometheus is not enough for you anymore. Or you need a different output, or you need different capabilities that only um, a vendor can give you. So Prometheus is a time series database, but what I really love about Prometheus is the fact they, um, they have a specification about how to expose metrics. And it doesn't really matter where they go. 
because they get exposed over a TCP, over a HTTP endpoint. So you instrument your application and you call slash metrics and what you get is something like that with your metrics. So it doesn't really matter who scraped them. Uh, it can be Prometheus, obviously, it can be Telegraph and that push them to a capacitor. It can be a, your script that does basic automation. It doesn't really matter. And that's what I think it's great. And I'm not the unique one because now the, CNC, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, it, it's, a, it's a branch of the Linux Foundation, is taking over this, the, this way, this method has a open specification that won't be just tied to Prometheus, but it will be the way to expose metrics from your application to the outside world. It's called Open Metrics. They announced it um, in August. And yeah, you can, you can read around, and I left a bunch of links at the end. As I told you, Prometheus is one, what is great about this exposition format is that Prometheus is, one, is just one of the hackers that can, can scrape your metrics. You can scrape the metrics from your application by yourself if you need some basic, really, really basic automation. So for example, this is a piece of code that I, I copied from the prompt to JSON. Um, daemon, it's a daemon that is able to read Prometheus metrics and translate them to JSON. You can do the same, but not translating them to JSON, but doing whatever you want. So let's say that you need to send an email to yourself every time that somebody purchased something. You can just do that scraping the metrics from Prometheus. And if you instrument your application to, with a counter that every time something, somebody purchased something, uh, gets up to one, you can just make the div and send you an email. So obviously it doesn't apply to production or whatever, but it, it's an idea that you can apply. So you, this, is, this come back to write dirty hacks, <laughs> write code, and try the API, because that's where everything matters. This is a bunch of links about what to read about open, uh, open metrics, so you're gonna read them by yourself. And how do we monitor Kubernetes uh, at InfluxDB? Obviously, we use our stack. So InfluxDB is the destination for all our time series. It's our database. And we have Chronograph, that is our dashboard. You can use Grafana if you, don't, if, you, if you are using it. It supports InfluxDB by default. And we, have a, and we deploy our applications. In this case, we deployed ATCD and a Go application. So we deploy them, Kubernetes, uh, select the nodes where to schedule my pod, and that's it. What we do, the concept of pods is great because you can have more than one containers, uh, not just one, but you can have more than one. So what we do, we put a telegraph that is our collector. Our collector grabs metrics from, it's an open source one, and grabs metrics from everywhere and push them to a destination. InfluxDB is our own one, but it supports CloudWatch, uh, Kafka, whatever you need. So uh, in this way, we are sharing the network namespace. So we can, our application can communicate to the, um, to the Telegraph sidecar in localhost, and it collects the metric, and it pushed a bunch of metrics to, to our storage. That's it. If you, if you need to configure specific application because they have specific requirements about how to get metrics, obviously every, every application um, exposes metrics in a different way. Somebody uses Prometheus exporters, somebody has a socket, somebody has a, a file that you need to read, and so on. So Telegraph, it's able, you can configure your, your collector in the best way uh, your, the, the, the application that you are monitoring requires. Now, now that we have, we have an idea about how to get metrics and how to store them, the problem is that we are not in a single replicas kind of beautiful world. We are in a distributed system world. So we need to understand how or where a specific request is going. You know, we don't have a huge amount of microservices, of services, microservices or whatever you call them. We have 20 of them. Um, but it's already a big problem to understand what's going on. Because you have retries, so if something, ch if something breaks, 
your application, your service A retries and retries, so you don't know how many times it, it retried. And if you have, you know, if, if you, you can, we have proxies that forward uh, requests to other services, uh, how many times your application uh, required for a token. So all these, question, all these questions are hard to answer. And you need to tell the story about every single request. And we do that using distributed tracing. So this is, a, uh, this is Zipkin, that is a Java open source um, distributed tracer application. It's made by, it's open sourced by Twitter. And as you can see, there is a list of services. This is the representation of, of one request. So this is one request that you do, that a client does to your, your, your system. You have the list of services that that specific request went through and you have a block that is called span that describe a piece of a function or something happened in your application. So the one that I, I highlight is the MySQL select. So what I'm doing, I'm tracing the MySQL select queries um, in the service flat server um, for that request. So you can see how long it took, you can even, you know, Spans has the concept of key values, so you can store the query and you can see what's going on. So what I'm using here is a, it's called open tracing, that it's another standard. So this applies. And, but why I think for this use case, we need a standard. We need a standard because there are a lot of libraries and there are a lot of vendors. We write code for different application, but at the end of the story, the trace needs to, be, needs to look like one. Doesn't matter where it comes from, if it's a Python application, if it's a Go application, if it's a front-end uh, Android, Java application, whatever it is. So that's why I think um, standards apply for this use case. And obviously, if, you, if there are many vendors, you don't like to be st sticked in one vendor specifically. So if you, have, if you, have, if you follow a standard, you can replace uh, the, the part of the libraries that push the metrics and you are pushing to another, to another destination. So a trace is made of spans. So every block is a span. You can have a child span, so you can have a hierarchy of them. And every span has logs. So logs are events that are assigned to a specific span that happens in that specific range of time from that specific function. So you know, as I told you, this is just aggregation. So you think about every request has an ID, a unique ID, and this unique ID is propagated th through all your um, applications and you attach information to that trace ID. And you combine all these points together, so in our case it's not you, but it's the distributed tracer, it's Zipkin or, Ye or Jaeger or whatever, and it gives you a, a picture, a representation of what's going on. So every span has logs. Every span has a span context, and the span context uh, is a key value um, store that you attach to your span, and it goes propagated to all the chain. So there is, there is a difference. There are key value pairs that are not propagated. So let's, say that, let's take the example of the MySQL select. The MySQL select, you can attach the um, the user that made the request to MySQL, so the authorized user to MySQL, or you can store the query. But it, not, it doesn't need to be propagated to another service because the scope uh, of the information is in that specific span. But there are other information that are important to propagate all over the place. I'm thinking about authorization. Who did that specific request? That information can be a key value store because you can, you can store the user ID and the, the, the ID of the user, but that information is important to know across all the trace. Because if you need to catch a bug where at some point in your chain, a service gives you a 401 because it's not able to, to, to authorize the token anymore, if you have the user ID propagated to all the, the chain, you can, say, you can see probably okay, this service has a bug and it's changing the user ID on the, or the token for that specific request. Get me? And 
So span contexts are key values that are propagated, and spans has key values stored that just live for that span. And obviously you need a tracer, and the tracer is the brain where you store the, 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 the traces and where you get them back. So there are a bunch of them that are open source, Zipkin, Jaeger, for example. Uh, there are other service tools, Amazon X-Ray um, is a, a popular tracer provided by Amazon that, has, uh, that is compatible with open tracing. Uh, Lightstep is another uh, vendor that has tracing. Uh, Honeycomb has tracing, and so on. So this is how, how the infrastructure for tracing looks like. You have all your application, application logic, or a Lambda function, or a gRPC server, and whatever. You instrument this application. So there is, a, there is work to do as a developer, because you need to configure the tracer, and you need to uh, go over that. All these applications are sending the trace to an open tracing, to, via the open tracing API to the tracer, Zipkin, Jagger, and so on. And that's it. I, I did a bunch of examples using Go, but you know, the li libraries are almost the same and they are simple, so I, I hope you can kind of get them. Uh, this is the main of your function. So Java has its own main and C has its own main. So in the main, you set the global tracer. So you point where your trace are gonna go. There are, tra there, there are concrete tracer for every, Zipkin has its own one and Jaeger has its own one. So some tracing implementation dot new is the tracer itself. And from that point in time, you don't care about the, the, the destination anymore. You just use the open tracing SDK, so you are vendor agnostic or destination agnostic, and that's very important. But this is a function, let's, let's assume that this is the, the one that generated the mysql.select span, and what you do is you start a span, I do that from, from context because Go adds context, and you give it an operation name. In my case, well, it was mysql.select, and you defer, the firm is the, is a, you, you, the firm means a function that gets executed when the, the parent function is done. So you are kind of closing the span and say, okay, this span is over. And you attach logs or key value store or whatever to the span. So when, you, when it gets finished, it gets propagated to the tracer. Yeah, this is the same, but with a child span. So you get your span with the operation name and you can do uh, a child span from the parent, and that you, get, you get a hierarchy of what's going on. I told you about taking pictures of your application running in Kubernetes, but how do you extract them? So every language has a runtime uh, profiling library. Go has a really good one, it is called pproof, and uh, it gives you runtime information about what's going on in the Go engine itself. So it looks like this one. So you import the net HTTP proof and you open a HTTP server that returns those information. You have a, a CLI tools that you point to the profile and it gives you the profile. That's it. You have a different visualiz visualization or different profile that you can get, there is the heap one, there is the number of routines and this kind of stuff, and you can build visualization. This one is a PNG, so you can see what's going on in the, ch the chain of, of functions that uh, it's calling. So this is what I mean when I say take the, take the pictures of what's going on. Because you take the pictures, Kubernetes goes and makes the life cycle of your application great, but you still have a chance to reproduce what's going on. So this is important, it's, a, it's the bag of information that you carry on and you use for troubleshooting. InfluxDB extended pproof to return not just runtime information from the Golang engine, but also from what matters to us. So InfluxDB is a, is a database, so we have people that run queries we consume memories and whatever, so what we, we have logs. So we extended the proof to return inside this bag information that matters for us. So the number of queries, 
which queries they are all recorded. And what it's great, you know, a, a small amount of them, the last 10 minutes or whatever, are recorded in there. And it's great because when we need to troubleshoot a problem, we can ask to the community or to our customer to grab the profile and send it to us. And in that profile, we have everything we need. And we don't, and from, there, from there, we are good to go. So I put a bunch of slides about how, to, how we extend it. But it's an HTTP server, so you attach a new route to the HTTP server, and you have new capabilities. So in our case, what we are adding, uh, we have a, a new request that is called pproof slash all, and it returns a tar uh, file with information like the number of go routines, the heap profile, the blocking profile, the mutex, so uh, the, the locked object, and the CPU profile, and we added the show shards, so the number of shards and the t tables in our database, uh, some stuff from the database, and uh, diagnostic um, information that we get from from database. So every time that, that you call that pproof slash all, you are creating a bag with all this information and you are extracting them. This is it. So. Yeah, you collect all these metrics. I'm just going to go over this because it's too hard. Um, so the show diagnostics, for example, is just going to reach the database, and it's going to ask for, the, for that query. Show diagnos diagnostics is just a query that you run in the database. So we run it during a profile, and we send it to us. That, that's how it looks like. So I think really interesting here. So. I'm back to the tracing, because that's where all the magic happened, according to me. And uh, this is one application. This is the custom orchestrator that we've wrote. We've, we interact a lot with AWS. And AW, the AWS SDK is, has a really powerful set of events that you can hook to, and you can build a trace. So we are building a trace for, we are tracing all the requests that we do to AWS, because our orchestrator is not really an intensive uh, you know, traffic, an underload application. It gets the right amount of load, but we need to be able to troubleshoot everything that happens for every request, because every request is very complicated. So before having tracing, uh, we was not really caring about retries. So let's say that Amazon fails, and we reach the quota from AWS, we just retry. What can go wrong? That was what was going wrong. Uh, that chain is the same request that we did over and over and over and over for 10 minutes. And we made the number of spans, you can see the number of spans under, as the number of requests, so, so we was making more than 100 requests uh, to AWS, just the same and retrying forever. So make your retry smart because the, it's important. So don't just retry every time because it's easy. Tracing, tracing and observability in general are different from the concept of monitoring because they are good for troubleshooting. So monitoring is great because it, it gives you a sign when something is wrong in production, and that's good. You need it. Observability is more about learning how your application behaves, because we don't know that. Even if you're a good developer, you don't know what your application is doing. Somebody yesterday spoke about the number of layers and uh, libraries that you use and the abstractions that hide uh, the underlying information. And that's the consequences. We have layers. They are great as a developer because you know, they make our life easier, but they hide context and they make troubleshooting a pain. So this, in this particular example, I, I'm using, I have the tracer enabled uh, in my local environment all the time. So I'm tracing all, all the requests that I did. And as you can see, I have a, I have a span that is called register instances to uh, ELB, so it's the, it's the step where all the instances for a particular cluster are ready, and I attach them to the load balancer, so the, the customer can reach the load balancer and, solve in, and resolve in 50B. As you can see, there are three requests. Two of them, one is, is, is an ES2 request, and two of them are ELB v2. I wasn't expecting Obviously, I, somebody notified me that I, I, I had a bug, so I, I tried to reproduce it. 
And I saw that the request that was failing had three span, three request, three AWS requests, and the one that was succeeding had, had two. So, and I knew at this point that the problem was in the registered instance to ELB, to, to load balancer area. So I was able to jump in just in the function that I was looking for and fixing the problem without even opening the IDE. I was just looking at the trace and say, okay, this is where it's broken. This is where I'm going to, where I'm going to check. And we fixed the bug. So as I told you, you can attach a lot of information to a span, and this is a visualization of the span. So this is um, a span that we generate, that we record from AWS. So as you can see, the name is aws.ac2. So it tells us that it's a AWS interaction to the AC2 service. And it's a post. And it returns 200, so it's OK. And uh, we also record, as I told you, it's not a really intensive application, but we need to have all the information we can get every time. So we are storing the response from AWS, because it's there where we can understand what's going on and why our application is not behaving as it should be. Um, in the abstract, there is a section about remote debugging, uh, but it doesn't really wor work for what we are what we was trying to do. So I put there when I wrote the application because I thought we, were, we was gonna use it. But when we tried it with you know debugging, wasn't what we was looking for because we can't stop the the application and follow the bre the breakpoint. But tracing uh, tracing is a really good alternative for that. So uh, have a look at it. No, that's it. Yeah, so yeah, it's not true. You can still use GDB or whatever you want, but uh, and you just expose the ports from Kubernetes and you, you, you run it. It's easy. Nothing to say about that. So uh, I have 10 minutes left. And I need less than them, so let's summarize. Um, make your hands dirty, so use your power to break stuff. Uh, bring developers and ops in the loop because we are on the same silos and we work together on that. Write tools. Observability, metrics, event, tracing, and logs are great. Instrument, the code instrumentation is the first citizen. So take care about how do you log, how do you trace, how do you collect events, and do tracing. Bunch of links that you can read, and thank you. Ooh. Any questions? Questions. I'm happy to answer any question, even not related to my, my talk. So let's go. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, there seems to be a bit of overlap between open census and uh, open tracing. Can you talk a little bit more about where you'd use the one and the other? Yeah. Um, open tracing is for all the pieces, so metrics, events, and tracing. Uh, open tracing was just for tracing. They didn't agree on the same standard as, as, it, as standard works. Uh, but now they are kind of agreeing. So it, they, uh, they are going together. So I'm expecting in a couple of months it will be compatible and it will be the same. So they, 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 the idea is you should use, you, the way I will like, I, I go is use open census and open tracing will be just injected in the open tracing lab, library at some point. Hi. Uh, question about uh, so, so building tooling side of the world. So uh, have you looked at uh, the operator SDK, for example, for Kubernetes? I and can't really hear you. Sorry. Sorry. To your face. Cool. <laughs> there we go. Uh, question about whether you've looked at uh, op the operator SDK in terms of developing tooling and when, if you can share any insights, you find the decision point to go towards you building your own operators uh, as opposed to just building to external tooling to run and glue together things in the Kubernetes cluster? OK. Uh, that's a good question. We are not, uh, OK, I don't know if I heard all of it, but I'm going to try. Um, the, there is an operator SDK that is developed by CoreOS and now Red Hat and now IBM and whatever. Um, to build operators. We, we don't use that because we was doing operator before the library was, was made, so we went to the learning process 
when it wasn't there. So we write the uh, CRDS, customers with definitions, and we hook them together, and that's it. Uh, we write operators because it comes from the idea that you, um, uh, operational U UX is, is, is a thing that we like. So the kubectl is our entry point for the operation side. So we are bringing all the external tools to the kubectl. And that's why we build operators and not external stuff, because we like to include them in the flow of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes gives, gives us capabilities like authorization, authentication, all built in. Pagination for the library, for the, for the resources, and so on. So we like to put stuff together more than diverging. And we, we took Kubernetes as a place where stuff goes together. I don't know if I answer, but. Hello. Um, I have a question around the overhead of your operational monitoring. Uh, how would you go about looking at the trade-offs and balances? Like, wh what would be your insights be there if, if you're instrumenting quite a bit of your code with spans and stuff? How would that like impact your performance, scalability, that, that sort of thing? Okay. Yeah, it's a good question, but the answer is you can have the most fast and you know, performant code, but if you don't know what's going on, it doesn't matter. So there is obviously a, tra a trade-off and a limit that you need to understand based on what you, you are looking for, uh, what you need. But it really depends on the implementation of the SDKs that you are using. So there are libraries that are open tracing libraries or open census libraries that are better than others. So there are something that there are some of them that collect and uh, in memory and send a bunch of requests all together. That's great. There are some of them that are bad and makes a request every time. So it's really something that you can try and, see and, and look around in the code. But um, yeah, as I said, there is no power without control. So you can be powerful and performant as most and perfect, but if you don't know what's going on, it's gonna be a problem at some point. So instrument your code, instrument it in a way that it works. There is trade off, but it's not that big, so I, I don't, I never had issues, and we do the databases, so it can performance matters too, so. Hello, yeah, great talk. I was uh, just wondering about how much integration you've done with AWS X-Ray and what your experience using it versus various other tracing tools is. We, we never used X-Ray, so I just know that it supports open tracing, and I know how it works in, in uh, so you have the open, some of the, obviously this, this, this changes a lot based on the language that you're using, but uh, you just hook the X-Ray uh, tracer to the open tracing library, and from that point in time, you are tracing to X-Ray. So probably the best person to reach are the Amazon guy for that. I don't really know. I just know that it exists. Cool, thanks so much for the talk. Hi, um, one thing that some like, service meshes at the moment, like Istio, they almost promise to kind of do some of your open tracing for free with the sidecar. Um, so Istio sidecar will actually trace any requests coming into your pod, um, but you miss out on some of the tracing from within that service. Um, and also if you've got an async queue that's trying to pull and pulling down, you miss it. It feels a bit messy, like what you defer to Istio, what you write yourself, have you had experience in trying to pull that together? Yeah, um, yeah, Istio is good because even Nginx does the same, so there is a plugin that if there is not, if there is not uh, open tra tracing ID, it generates one and it gets propagated. And if, there is, if there is in the header, it takes the, the value and it goes to the other one. So uh, Istio has the, you know, it's, it's good because you can trace all your application from the same point, as you said, but you don't have the, the bag that, that it's, it's good when you don't know what's going on. So uh, how you bring those together doesn't, you need to do, you need, if you're using Istio, you, you know, how I can say that? Uh, in your application, you can, you can get the, the, the trace ID and you can build a span from the trace ID that is, that, that, is, that is coming from Istio and you can add that stuff. So I think it's just the way to go. So uh, if there is not, you, you don't write in your application the part that says, okay, if there is no trace ID, give me one trace ID and we'll propagate it. That's not important because you have Istio that does that. In your application, you just have the piece of code that creates a span, that gets the span from the trace ID and put your information inside the span. 
So I think you can't really combine them together at the moment. You use them together. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, really, kind of related to the previous question. How uh, do you have any tips or kind of general rules for how you decide what to trace and what kind of level of granularity you want to go? Because you could just have your traces from the service mesh, or you could do uh, per like API path or per function or per like loop in your code, yeah. like how fine grained you go. Um, how did we decide? Um, we trace everything that goes over the network. So everything that goes over the network is traced. That's it. So API request, database interaction, um, everything there is traced. And it's, you know, it, you are doing forensic analysis, so there is, there is a murderer, and you need to find who did that. So there is a bug in some place, there is something that's not working, and you need to instrument to have the visibility on that. So um, I think if you start to trace what goes to another system, it's already a good start. So if you have a database and you reach a database, trace the, the SQL query that you are doing. If you're reaching another API, trace the request that you are doing. Obviously, based on uh, how much load you have, you should, you should trace more or less. Or uh, Every tracer has a capability of saying, this trace is a fake trace, so it won't be stored, because you know, there, are, there are requests that you call once every hour, and you need to have a really good visibility, so you need to trace every request for that, like the one I showed you. But there are other requests, that, other entry points that are called you know, millions of times uh, a minute, and uh, you can't trace all of them. So you can do a trace rate and say trace just the 1% of the request. So you can do this kind of, all, all of these are, is supported. But yeah, I will start to trace from what goes over the network. And obviously the code that changed most is also another point where you can go. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my question really would be, uh, how would you see rolling your own sort of tracing uh, compare against using an off-the-shelf tool like New Relic, where, which I believe does distributed traci tracing out the box and will instrument around almost all your functions and your database queries. Yeah, and, and can you justify yeah. like the cost-benefit across? Yeah, um, I'm not ag against uh, um, vendors, so I didn't. Uh, you know, New Relic is as the same as X-Ray or uh, Lightstep to me. So if you're using it, use it. And it's, it's compatible with, with open tracing. So you can, uh, uh, you can inject the new Relic tracer in the open tracing library, and you are ven vendor agnostic from there. So that works. I think that what matters to me is the fact that you should all, we should all work to have the events, metrics, and traces in the same place. Because that, and there are not a lot of tools that does that. Open source, closed source vendors, it's hard to do. Because as I say, the aggregation, the quality of the aggregation is what matters most than the data by themselves. So if you start to spread them around, it's gonna be hard to keep them, to, to query them together to have, to, to have the answer you need. So if you're using Neuralic, keep that, and it supports traces because it does that, use that, it's fine. Uh, if you don't, yeah, it's a good, it's a good solution. Zipkin is a good solution, so I don't, I don't have preferences. Hi. Awesome. Okay, great. So, great technical talk. A um, yeah. lot of great technical questions. Um, everyone's talking about Kubernetes. Do you use it in your vegetable garden? So, sorry. Do you use Kubernetes in your vegetable garden? Maybe a bit of tracing as well. <laughs> so, uh, can you can you say it? I don't know. <laughs> He's asking, do you use Kubernetes in all parts of your life, including your vegetable oh, garden? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, oh, my garden is an offline area. So uh. that doesn't have Kubernetes. That's where I go and I just crash everything. So uh, yeah, that, I'm you, the Kubernetes in my garden. So uh, I you, crash stuff there. You could uh, use like photo, f photographs on a Raspberry Pi and then nothing. send them it's back. It's an offline place. Oh, so okay. I'm there with so. myself and my plants and that's it. It's the happy place.